Amen. Hey, uh, welcome everybody to Church of Grace. Again, um, Pastor Tom, of course, today is a, a different kind of service, um, so I don't have a whole lot of time. And uh, Pastor Tom wanted me to share on, uh, on miracles with you today, miracles. Uh, of course, if you ask anybody what a miracle is, you can get all kinds of different responses, answers um, to that. I just want to stick to the biblical point of view. Uh, Pastor Tom mentioned it this morning, and the Greek word meaning dunamis, which is where we get the Greek word dynamite. It is the inherent power of God. But watch this. It is only a the power of God. It is only this word when it's actually expressed in the natural world. In other words, if it remains spiritual, then it's not power. If, if it remains something not seen or experienced, then it, rem- it, it is not a miracle. It is not the power of God. It is an idea, which we get in today's enlightenment period of Plato and Gnosticism, where everything is spiritual, and we cannot wait to leave this big, bad earth and this ugly, bad body and live in a spiritual disembodied existence in heaven someday. That does not come from Jewish Hebrew perspective or from the word. It comes entirely from different philosophies of the Enlightenment age that has crept into the church where we now say that God doesn't heal people's bodies because, well, you know, it's not promised. God doesn't care so much about your body. And we forget that you are a whole person, not just a spirit. Some amens would be nice, you know. I'm just kidding. You know, but, but God actually, and what's sad is then you then deny God as a good creator. Mm. It's okay. We'll get there. No, we don't because we don't have much time. But, <laughs> but a miracle, the miracle working power of God, that's what this service is about. We are giving space. Why are you doing a special service like this? Because we are giving a place and a space for ministry, for love, for prayer, for communion, for time together as a family where we worship, we uplift the name of Jesus, and we give time and space towards praying and ministering to other people that God's power, the miraculous working of power, may be at work. We are giving space for his miracle working power. That's what this is about. This isn't some kind of, I don't know, that's what it's about. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, please. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. If you don't have your Bibles, please look up on the screen. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now, before we continue, I want to break down this verse for a moment because this word gospel, if you're new to church, if you're new to Christianity, you're like, what is the word gospel? Like, I've heard that, you know, gospel, gospel, gospel. Gospel simply means good news. Good, not, it's not bad news. It's good news, which is why a depressed Christian doesn't work. A, a, a set, but Josh, you don't understand the things I'm going through. No, I do. I'm going through them too, but I'm choosing to fix my mind on the good news, not the bad news. It, it's a choice. I'm just telling you, it is a choice. Like you have to, it's not easy. I didn't say it was easy. Like, it, it's not like, oh, yeah, it's just a breeze, dude. No, 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 no. Like, if it was a breeze, then everybody would be happy and joyful. <laughs> but they're not because it's difficult to set your mind when everything's staring at you the wrong way. So this good news is news of an actual event. It's not an idea or a theology. The good news, the gospel, is that something happened. This dude, this guy, I'm reverential. I, he knows that. I don't mean it. Just, Jesus died, claimed to be the son of God, and he resurrected. He, he, he resurrected. That's the good news that happened. See, let me, let me explain this way. I was a, when I was a missionary in Thailand, I, I'm a big hockey fan. I've played hockey a lot, a lot of my life, and I'm a huge Mighty Ducks, Ducks fan. Right? And so I'm a missionary in Thailand, and of course the year I'm in Thailand, the Ducks win the Stanley Cup. Yeah. So watch this, though. I'm in Thailand, and I don't get to watch the games because I'm in Thailand, right? Like, they don't have cable TV like we do. I mean, they, you know, anyways, that was back in 2007. Anyways, I'm in Thailand, and I hear the news that the Ducks won. The, the bummer is nobody else in Thailand cares. <laughs> so I'm sitting here rejoicing. <laughs> hey, Pichai, Pichai, the Ducks won. Baba, what, what, the Ducks won? What do you mean? But see, whether they liked it or not, whether they believed it or not, the Ducks still won. 
See, there's a lot of people that don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead or that Jesus is alive today. A lot of people don't care, but it doesn't nullify the fact or the truth that it actually happened. So we that believe that event is the very power of God unto our salvation. Now, watch what we do with this. This is what we should do. Imagine you are the curator of a museum of amazing, beautiful pieces of art. Imagine that your museum is filled with the most amazing things. But, but then one day, this person walks in with this piece of art and says, I want to gift you this piece of art. Now, this piece of art is no normal piece of art. It is an art piece. It is, my wife got it. Okay, it is so beautiful and so magnificent. Human eyes have never embraced such beauty in the cosmos. It is, a, it is so amazing. In fact, wow, this piece of art is amazing. The only problem is my museum does not have a place or a space worthy to hold such a piece of art. So what do I do? I demolish the museum. And I rebuild this new museum with this beautiful piece of art in mind. I'm not building a room for this piece of art. I'm building the building around the piece of art. This piece of art now becomes centerpiece to this museum's entire existence. What I'm saying is that this good news of the resurrection ought to be like that for us. That the resurrection and this good news is not worthy of a room in my life. It is worthy of my entire life dying and being rebuilt around the truth of the resurrection. See, though my old ways of thinking, my old ways of living, my old ways of behaving are unworthy of the truth of this good news. I can't think the same, I can't act the same, I can't treat you the same, and if I continue to look at this world the same way, I am just putting that piece of art in a back room somewhere instead of making it the centerpiece of my entire existence, which whether you believe it or not is true. Is the power of God unto salvation? Now I have to ask a very important question. And really the, the answer to this question will tell me as a doctor, which I'm not, it, where you are and where you are going in life. It's a very simple question. It is this, what does the word salvation mean to you? And all of you are thinking, running it through your minds, maybe, or maybe you're thinking about lunch. I don't know. But you're thinking about salvation. What does that word mean? If you are a common Christian in America, and, and I'm saying this from people I meet and speak to and talk to all the time, not even what Christians believe salvation means, but even what non-believers believe Christians believe it means, is salvation means I'm going to heaven, not going to hell. Amen, right? right? <laughs> okay, yeah, right? That, that, that's the normal thought is I'm in this big bad world and I'm going to escape and go to heaven one day. And so the idea of salvation then is twofold. I was saved that date. Maybe you can think of it for me, July 4th, 2005, when I rededicate my life, when I consider I was really saved. You know, that moment of coming to faith moment. You all remember that day that you believed, you say, I was saved then. I, and therefore, I, and then the second part of it is I will be saved, which is I know that one day at the judgment seat of God, I will have boldness and I won't go through the same judgment. I'm not going to hell. I'm good with God, right? So we have this. I was saved and I will be saved. The problem with this ideology of simply salvation and the power of God saving me from hell and going to heaven is that then when we read the Gospels of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are simply long-winded introductions to Jesus who would eventually go to the cross and resurrect. They're nothing more than introductions or summaries to get us introduced to this man to get to the point of death and resurrection. And then the epistles don't become life-transforming letters. They could become simply how to hold on for dear life from that moment you gave your life to Jesus to the moment you go to heaven. 
I, I hope I'm stepping on some toes and smashing them to pieces. Because the problem with that ideology, which doesn't come from the Bible, it comes from Plato. It comes from Gnosticism, Gnosticism, which denies the, the, the creation, denies the creator, that it was never God's intention. It is not a Jewish idea, not a Hebrew idea that you go to heaven, but rather that heaven comes here. Let me say that again. It is not God's plan and ultimate objective that you go to heaven. It is God's ultimate objective because he created creation that he inhabits here. He brings heaven here. Notice what the resurrection proves. That we, our purpose, our destiny is not a disembodied, spiritual, woo, floating around some mystical place in a other part of the cosmos. No, it is that God has always planned and loved and enjoys giving us a body. He cares about that. And what the resurrection proves is that death has been defeated. See, what is salvation to you if it's simply that you're going to heaven? You, will don't, you won't do anything for God. Because your whole perspective of life is getting there which is the opposite direction of God. God's saying, no, come here. No, we're going here. We're, we're, we're bringing the powers of heaven here. Jesus said the only time he told people how to pray was what? Your will be done in heaven as on earth? No, on earth, on earth, on earth, as it is where? In heaven. And Jesus then fulfilled that. Jesus is the fulfillment of your will done on earth. So now, when I don't see that this life is all about I was saved and I will be saved, but now I see that salvation is not, just, is not about me going to heaven, but salvation, the actual word better translated is the word rescue. You have been rescued from what? Rescued from hell? No, it's so much bigger than that. You have been rescued from the enemy called death. What do the powers of this world hold against you? What is the ultimate power they have? Death. If you don't obey me, I will kill you. See, Caesar was not intimidated by a bunch of Christians that just couldn't wait to get to heaven. He was intimidated by a bunch of Christians who believed that they would one day be resurrected and they are holding him accountable for everything he did and said. And so you can try to kill me all you want. I'm resurrecting, bro. Come at me. I'm going to resurrect. Oh, man. Rescue from death. See, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, what they did is they worshipped someone other than creator. They worshipped a different God. They worshipped, in a way, creation itself. And like the spiritual principle law is, whatever you worship, you become like. So if you are literally embracing this creation and everything about it, then yeah, you're worshipping creation instead of the creator. You'll become just like it. Dumb, deaf, blind. It's all in Psalm 115. When they sinned, what happened was death entered in and God's good creation, remember he created everything and called it good. And then he created you and said, uh-huh, very good. <laughs> and, then Adam, and then he created a woman and I was like, whoa, man. Okay, 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 okay. We don't, we'll. but, but death creeped in. And then creeping death barged in, and now God's good creation immediately begins to experience decay. People die. People get sick. His beloved good creation, their bodies, the earth, begins to experience disease, distress, sickness, pains that he never created. See, the sad part is when it's all about us getting to heaven, death then becomes my ally, not my enemy. 
because then it's only death I need to experience before I finally get to the ultimate destination. And that is wrong. That is unbiblical. Death is the last enemy of God. Death is an enemy and everything involving death, God is against. How can you prove that? The resurrection. If he wanted a disembodied future, Jesus would have floated up to heaven, leaving his body here. But God took that body. What if he was cremated? God's pretty good at finding atoms. Okay, because <laughs> I know that thought will come on someone on YouTube, you know, watch it. What about, what if that cannibal, you know, ate a Christian and then he's got that particle, you know, because you become what you eat. You get all kinds of that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah you do. But what, he didn't leave his body here to rot and just say, you're some, di- I don't care about your body. I, you know, I just want your disembodied, your spiritual self. No, 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 no. He said, I love that body and I'm going to renew it. I'm going to rescue it from the pains of death. You will not experience corruption. Come on. Yes. Come on. And, and so now what we do, now what we see is indeed when I go through the gospels, it's no longer an introduction to the cross and resurrection. It is Jesus giving us a blueprint and image of what it looks like when kingdom of God comes here right now. The forgiveness of sins. What is that? Rescue from death. The the healing of sickness. What is that? Rescue from death. The raising of the dead. Rescue from death. So apparently we are not waiting for that ultimate moment of new creation of heavens and earth. Jesus initiated the new creation project when he was raised from the dead and showed us what it looks like. Therefore, the disciples, when they got baptized in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, they didn't just sit around waiting for heaven to come, sweet by and by, but all of our hymns and songs, when we get to heaven, something you know it's all everything well you know i'll be i'll prosper in heaven i'll i'll, I'll be well in heaven I'll, I'll i'll do that in heaven i'll yeah 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 you're exactly where the devil wants you irrelevant the, the, the devil's not afraid of that he's afraid of someone that's going to declare the resurrection power in the face of death here and now See, see, Paul said, every day I am facing death and every day the resurrection life of Jesus comes out. Come at me, death. Jesus and his resurrection power is already living in me. What are you going to do? Come at me. So, I was saved. I will be saved. But right now, I am being saved being saved. Look at 1 Corinthians. I'm, I'm closing. I've got two minutes. 1 Corinthians 1.18. It says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. See, I'm not just been saved and going to be saved one day. I am being saved. I need his salvation every day. I need his saving power, his dynamite, his miracle working power unto salvation every day. See, we're living in a world where death is not happy. Whenever you have two parties that are opposite coming at each other, it's called tension. The Bible calls it tribulation. If you're not experiencing tribulation, perhaps you're not much alive. I don't mean that. No, I mean it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I do. Yeah. It's it's the godly that suffer persecution. I could get up here and preach a message that says, you know, whatever will be, will be. Guess what? I won't be persecuted for that. Because then there's nobody standing up for justice. Then there's nobody standing up for God's will in heaven on earth. There's nobody standing up for poverty. There's no one standing against evil. They're just, whatever happens, happens. God must be in bed with evil. God must be using that to teach us something. I know I'm preaching real good right now. Uh Uh-huh. But no, that is evil. I call it what it is. You are evil, you are death, and I'm going to stand up against it. That sickness, it wants to destroy your body. I'm going to agree with you and I'm going to stand with you against it. 
those evil dictators want to uh, um, uh, cause greater poverty to increase in their people, I will do what I can by the power of the gospel, by the power of the spirit to stand up against injustice. Why? Because I care about the here and now because it is God's good creation. And God is starting to renew and rescue his good creation, including our bodies, from death. In Matthew 9, see the woman with the issue of blood touched him in his garment, and Jesus said, daughter, your faith has saved you. Same word, saved you. In other words, the good news you heard about me when you touched me, that power unto your salvation flew out and you experienced salvation. Did she go to heaven? No, 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 she got healed. Jesus calls that salvation. She didn't go to heaven. What did she experience? Rescue from death. Why? Because she believed the good news about Jesus. See, this power unto salvation is only for those who believe. I did not say no, I said believe. You can know some things, but it doesn't mean you believe some things. I... I you're believing God for this. What scriptures are you standing on? I don't know. I heard you say that. No, bro. It don't work that way. You got to take that seed and plant it in your heart and let it germinate. Let it do some growing. Let it do some building. And eventually you'll experience it and you will become, as Abraham, fully persuaded that what God has promised, he is also able and powerful to perform. I cannot do that for you. You must do that with God yourself. This woman, how did she begin to believe? She would wash the dishes. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. Why? She must have heard something about this guy being very powerful. So she came to the conclusion via the Holy Spirit working with her that if I touch the hem of his garment, the prayer shawl, I'm going to be whole. So she's washing the dishes. She's doing the laundry all the time. She's still sick. She's still sick. Oh, you're just denying uh, my sickness. No, I am embracing the truth of Jesus. I'm embracing the power of the gospel. She's still sick. And then all of a sudden, she gets to the point where she's doing this again, and it's been like a week, and she's been saying it over, and if I touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And now all of a sudden, she hears, uh, you know, uh, Shaniqua over there is like, hey, Jesus is in town. And so she said, okay. She dropped the dishes. She dropped the towel, and she went running, not even remembering that she could be stoned to death, not counting her life dear unto herself, and goes, why? Because when Jesus becomes bigger than the problem, you're there. What we're doing is Jesus making Jesus big. Your problem's small. She touched and Jesus said, my power has given you salvation. She didn't go up to heaven. Paul, when he was shipwrecked and saved, what did he say? I've experienced salvation. The woman with, uh, the, the, with the, uh, that, that cried on his feet, Jesus said, your faith has saved you. Salvation, this rescue from death, it's not about going to heaven. It's about God's good creation, including our bodies, our hearts, our minds. God's good creation being renewed, being restored, being healed from death. Why? Jesus already defeated death. Worship team, if I can have you come on up. I want to close with this quote. It's a, by a theologian. His name is N.T. Wright. He says, the work of salvation in its full sense is about whole human beings. God is not interested in just saving some invisible spiritual side of you. He isn't interested in saving all of you. Your body is beautiful to God. It's his temple. And he has a future for your body. And I felt like when I was preparing, I felt like saying this, that some of you, including myself, need to change the way we think about our own bodies. We have a negative view. We have a negative and wicked view of our bodies, that we just treat it whatever it wants. Sugar, yes please. 
Alcohol, more please, another round. Drugs, whatever it is. Like this body is not respected the way it should be. We, we look at it and maybe it doesn't look the way you want it to look. But it doesn't change that it's still God's good creation and it is still his temple. He loves you, including your body. He wants your body whole. He wants your body healed. He wants your body loved. He wants you to love your body and to treat it with the respect that he does, which he died for. Not just your spirit, but the whole you. That when you put off this tent, when this body does lay down to rest, guess what? It will be resurrected into a glorious new body that can walk through walls, that can eat. You're like 30 years old all the time. <laughs> what a glorious future.